Good afternoon, audience. This is the Asia Thinker series for COVID-19. Uh, today's topic is lessons learned from the pandemic, consequences on climate change, biodiversity crisis, and of course, for the health sector. This event is supported by the Singapore Global Network, a division under the Economic Development Board. And my name is Susan Ross. I'm from the Asian Development Bank. I'm the moderator of the session today. And uh, I'd like to start with a few framing words for this webinar. Um, what uh, we see currently in this pandemic is uh, something we haven't seen before. It's very interesting to realize that countries are willing to really significantly curb their economies to save lives, while others are choosing management strategies that are more palatable to maintain economic outputs. We also do see that countries are struggling with the collateral damage on um, you know, vaccination programs, on other health impacts that come from locking down uh, economies. And we do see that countries don't really have one way to respond to this unprecedented uh, pandemic. Um, the question is, what can we learn uh, from this pandemic and how countries uh, react? What can we learn for the climate crisis? How do we explain also these variations that countries show? And uh, we want to really now uh, discuss these very important questions um, how we can learn lessons uh, from this pandemic for climate change um, and for the biodiversity agenda. And I'm extremely happy to have with us um, today um, a, a very reputable panel. We have with us uh, Professor Janet Ikovic. She's the Dean of the Faculty um, um, and a Professor for Social Science at Yale National University uh, College. Um, Jeanette will provide us with insights on the interaction of health and climate change and how important social and behavioral science is to actually understand how people interpret threats and change their behavior. And then we have with us Professor Ben Kishore. Um, he's the Lee Kang Shing Professor in Public Management at the um, LKU uh, School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And um, what fascinates me with Ben is his moral framework, and he will share views about the need for new moral frameworks, which will help us to solve these super wicked problems like the pandemic and climate change that we are seeing right now, and that sometimes some of us probably feel paralyzed from these problems that we are seeing. And then I'm extremely happy to have with us uh, Professor Vina Thomas. He's a visiting professor at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and he has held many senior positions um, in the Asian Development Bank, um, in, in the World Bank, and I don't need more words probably to introduce him. And Vinod has always been a big optimist, and he provided ideas about the triple bottom line, how we bring sustainable development, economic development um, uh, together, and he will speak about his opinions, how we can now pave the way for a new development agenda uh, building on this pandemic. So thank you very much for being here today. And I would like to start with uh, Janet to give us um, a little bit of background for our very diverse audience uh, to understand the relationship between biodiversity, climate change, and the health sector. So Janet, please, over to you. Thank you, Suzanne, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. You know, biodiversity, climate, and health are really inextricably tied. Uh, climate change is making outbreaks of disease more common and more dangerous. There are many ways that climate change affects emerging and deadly infectious diseases like COVID-19. And since we just have a short time today, I'll, I'll just highlight a few. Um, first, reductions in biodiversity uh, as a result of the way that we use land, like clear cutting forests for palm oil or other economic development, uh, as well as the results of climate change itself, like uncontrollable wildfires and floods, quite simply reduce the distance uh, between people and the animals that spread disease, such as bats in the case of COVID-19. And it's estimated that as many as 75% of new viruses have emerged from animals. And in many cases, we humans are crowding them out of their natural habitats. A second example is the warmer weather and more rainfall uh, as a result of climate change that are expanding the geographic regions exposed to disease spread by insects, mosquitoes and ticks in particular, like malaria, dengue, and Zika. And as the climate warms, the mosquitoes actually move further north, 
in places where they've never existed before and they're bringing disease with them. A third example is air quality as a result of pollution due to fossil fuels and wildflower fires. And this results in respiratory illness and can aggravate cardiovascular disease, just as a couple of examples. And we've heard over the past few months during this COVID-19 epidemic that these pre-existing chronic diseases make us more vulnerable to infection and result in more severe symptoms and even greater risk of death. So we see in all of these ways, the links between biodiversity, climate, and health. And I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the impact around mental health. I hope we can get to that later in the hour. I think both mental health as a determinant and a consequence, uh, as we look at these complex problems, issues around anxiety and depression, isolation and overcrowding, all of these really impact our vulnerability in response to crisis and, uh, and also you know, our perceptions uh, in, in terms of action moving forward. So in closing, uh, just imagine the circular cycle where threats to biodiversity and climate change affect health, and then our health in turn makes us more vulnerable to future climate-related threats. And just like our own immune systems are the first line of defense against disease, Biodiversity is nature's defense. Janet, I'd like to continue with Ben, but I got one interesting question um, uh, from the audience here, and that is, um, Janet, do you think that governments acknowledge the link between climate change and um, the spread of um, the COVID-19 related virus? Not sufficiently. I'm really glad that we're here doing this. You know, we've got uh, these set of complex issues and each one alone is very complicated. And uh, when we think about these across systems, it becomes very important, again, because of really the quite direct causal pathways. But it will take panels like this and, and those of us who touch government and, uh, you know, and, and these many sectors, the health sector, the economic health sector, the policy sector, to make these links explicit when when problems are complex, we need complex solutions. We can't shy away. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important what you say. Uh, I mean, we will definitely have pandemics, um, more pandemics because of climate change. I think that's something we really have to say as one of the key messages. So it is time to prepare better in the future. It's not something that will happen every hundred years, right? We will see this more often and often. Absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, we believe that the uh, distance, the time between these major epidemics is likely to shorten. Okay, thank you, Janet. I mean, this really calls for a different approach to these problems. So Ben, I really like the moral framework um, that you use to explain how policy decisions are being made. Um, I struggle with many policy decisions <laughs> and I don't understand how people can make these decisions. So it's good, it would be great to hear from you how do you see that the current moral values, um, especially in developing countries, are shaping policy decisions? Uh, Suzanne, and it's wonderful to be here, part of this uh, conversation. Um, yeah, I wanted to just share with you some work that I've done on the biodiversity and climate crises, uh, where my colleague uh, Stephen Bernstein and myself asked the question, why is it um, that after 25 years of important scientific knowledge about the crisis and crises we're facing um, on biodiversity and climate. Why is it that we um, are developing policies that are inconsistent with that science? And we um, developed uh, through looking over 25 years of research on these questions, um, an argument that actually part of the challenge is that the analytical tools we employ carry with them four implicit um, moral philosophies about how to conceive of the problems we're facing. But because they're implicit, we're not really understanding how they're actually working. And so we work on bringing these things out and making them explicit, and then we also apply them to the, um, the COVID crisis. And we think they work quite well. So I wanna briefly review for you these four different moral philosophies that emerge from the different analytical tools that we employ. And the first one we called type one was made famous by Eleanor Ostrom 
who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for looking at resource depletion challenges. And she first looked at fish. And why are we over harvesting fish that's against our own long-term economic interests? And her point was that, geez, we're doing things that are collectively irrational, but individually rational. Because if you don't over harvest fish, your neighbor will. And hence, you may as well get some short-term benefits, even though in the long run, there are no more fish. And so um, this also applies to, in many ways, uh, some parts of the um, COVID management. When we see people hoarding things like toilet paper, for example. Um, now, of course, it's collectively irrational to do so. But if your neighbors are all, all hoarding toilet paper, you must also do that. Otherwise, you have no toilet paper in the short or long run. And so we see this problem conception working well for thinking about solutions over resource depletion um, in the COVID crisis. And how do you therefore maintain long-term economic benefits? And let me realize though that it wasn't just type one thinking that was going on, but also what we call type two, which was taking the economic benefits question but applying it to all kinds of problems. And we call this the optimization um, framework that's made famous through cost benefit analysis, where for example, there's a moral philosophy that you can compare everything that happens in society, whether it be lives or economic um, growth in ways that allow you to adjudicate how many lives to save and how many lives to lose based on an economic value. And that's why, for example, the United States Environmental Protection Agency values a human life at $9.47 million. So you can compare and contrast whether or not it's worth saving a human life. But that's a moral philosophy that underpins then um, how we think about adjudicating problems. And we see this showing up in COVID. For example, the Lieutenant Governor in Texas said that he'd be willing to die to save his grandchildren's economy, okay? And so we have these actual real world examples of this applying to the COVID crisis. Um, and then uh, Steve and I found that actually a lot of people in the sustainable development world pushed against that framework and said, look, we don't just care about economic values per se. We also care about social and environmental values. And so how do we best balance different values together in a moral framework about pluralism, deliberative democracy, and so on that's led to some really important choices and it frames how the United Nations develop the sustainable development goals of balancing different important values. And this works very well in many contexts, but however, it was applied in the, in the um, case of the uh, province of Newfoundland in Canada where I'm from to adjudicate how to stop over harvesting of their, their cod fishery. And the problem was the balanced approach identified a catch level higher than what the scientists said you could actually engage in to maintain the fisheries. And what happened was the fisheries uh, collapsed. And so there are some problems that actually must be given priority if they are to be actually solved. Um, and we argue the, the quintessential example is anti-slavery norms. We'd never give a cost benefit analysis or a compromise approach to the question of whether human beings should own other human beings, because it's a universal norm that we give priority to over other values. What we find in the uh, climate case is that um, we're not making biodiversity and climate type four priorities. We're undermining them with other values and moral philosophies. In the COVID case, however, we are seeing governments, in some cases, take type four approaches where lives matter as human lives. We see this, for example, in Ontario, New York, where the governors pushed back on the, the Texas Lieutenant Governor, we see actions in Singapore and elsewhere very proactive around the disease itself and managing for the disease. And so our point is, given these different moral philosophies that are at play here, and they're all legitimate, and they're all important, but they result in different policy responses, how do we make those moral philosophies explicit? And how do we engage in a conversation about what are the moral philosophies that we want as a society to guide our behavior? whether it's climate, biodiversity, or this COVID pandemic. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Ben. I mean, what we, what we do see is that uh, countries are using the moral, all aspects of this moral framework at the same time in a way, right? Yes, we are doing whatever it costs to protect some lives, but then we are also, uh, have, will definitely see a lot of additional deaths from malnutrition, from not being able to be vaccinated, mothers dying in childbirth because they can't access health services. So 
question is really who is designing this moral framework right now and is this done in a participatory approach i got one a question here from the audience that I would like to um, to, to give to to uh, give to the to the panel before we move to Vinod, and that is from uh, Jordan, who is asking, how can we now prepare governments better to actually um, uh, have um, a, a longer term memory and and make longer term policy decisions and change from from short termism to long termism? I know this is a question that we want to have later, but since it's just coming in, Ben, what what do you think? Yeah, so we find in our research on the climate crisis that uh, government policies have time and consistent preference problems. We push off the future in ways that we don't intend on doing, and we keep on undermining our long-term interests, especially on ecological processes that sometimes get undermined by short-term economic interests. So we think the trick is to develop institutions that have a mandate for long-term planning. We see this in monetary boards already. But how do you actually create institutions that are locked in for long-term thinking is one of the biggest challenges uh, facing, we think, our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So, Vino, you've always been um, very much in, in the future in your thinking. You started to think about uh, uh, how to bring economic growth and sustainable development together already um, many years ago. So um, my question for you is, um, considering now all these implications on the crisis, if we think, for example, on the, the huge impact on poverty levels everywhere in the world, but especially, of course, developing countries, uh, the reduced economic growth, the recession, the depression, um, we, we see increasingly governments are really worried. Um, are we really able to create these resilient, sustainable, green uh, policies and, 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 and shift economic development into a in, into the climate agenda and and what do you think how would these policies look like thank you uh, thank you susan great to be with you janet and ben and uh, also all of you who are joining in uh, we pay tribute to your interest uh, and also the um, uh, you're all practitioners so um, uh, thank you for your um, participation today um, on this question, uh, we are coming out, I hope, of a COVID-19 crisis, which ironically brings out uh, a very interesting phenomenon relating to the even bigger catastrophe that is likely to hit us unless we take action, and that is climate change. So on the one side, some of the things that we have observed that people uh, have been able to change lifestyles under the tremendous weight of a COVID-19, those changes uh, need to be locked in and can that be done? For example, uh, taking fewer flights, uh, biking to work and so on. But uh, furthermore, as we need to revive the economy and the po point on poverty is critical there, uh, as we revive the economy, can we do so in climate benign ways, which is basically in the, in the center of it, moving from high carbon, carbon intensive, polluting uh, energy and transport fuel to more green and renewable solar uh, and wind and other forms of renewable energies uh, in real time. And that is the question. Um, it is tough. If you look at the last 25 years, Germany comes close to an example where there has been this decoupling you grow, but the carbon intensity does not grow. Uh, Brazil falls on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, you grow some, but the carbon intensity goes up. Now, Southeast Asia, where Singapore is located, South Asia as well, and East Asia, are quintessential examples where this dilemma is, is, is very, very severe. Uh, this region, uh, is one of the highest contributors to the problem in terms of the carbon intensity of growth. Equally, it is also one of the most vulnerable uh, in that uh, climate disasters will likely hit the region, including Singapore, in a big way. Incidentally, in the case of Singapore, since we are here, a uh, hundred billion dollar uh, commitment has been made uh, to dealing with uh, climate issues especially the adaptation side. Uh, and however, it's over a hundred year period compared to the COVID uh, emergency and the urgency to action, 
that pales in comparison because uh, Singapore has been able to set aside 60 billion in a year for the COVID uh, reaction. So the question has been has to be asked: Why the urgency? Why the emergency? Why the uh, types of things that Ben and Janet talked about don't touch us the same way? That takes me back to Suzanne's question. Well, is it because there is a conflict with poverty reduction? If it is, it is completely understandable. Why would we uh, want to deal with climate change at the expense of reducing poverty? We would not. But here is the truth. Uh, the World Bank just recently did a study. COVID-19 is expected to very conservatively uh, put another 11 million people into poverty in the region in contrast to what would have been, which is lifting 35 million out of poverty. So the swing between the two is 46 million people. And that's a very conservative estimate. So the question is, climate disasters, COVID and pandemics hurt the poor the most. So if you can avoid them, it is really good for poverty reduction. Just let me give you one number uh, before closing. Um, if you look at uh, the situation ahead, if we were to deal with climate disasters uh, in the way IPCC, the UN Commission has uh, framed it uh, by nine, uh, 2035, we would need to spend something like 35 trillion with a T uh, 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 dollars uh, over that period of time. Uh, well, that's a lot of money. Uh, that is a lot of money indeed. But if we did not do that, the cost or the damages in lives and livelihoods will be 150, again, trillion, very conservatively, five times. And that impacts the poor the most. So the effect on the poor is worst without climate action. The effect on the poor can be better with climate action. Thank you, Vinod. And I think numbers are, are staggering. And, and uh, I think we are realizing now number one possible, but also what will be necessary uh, for uh, to address uh, the climate um, change related disasters. Uh, but one question, additional question I have for you, Vinod, how would these policies now look like? What, what kind of affirmative actions would countries really need to, to show now to change the game? Thing. Um... If, again, taking a leaf out of the COVID-19 experience um, and also perhaps in Ben's framework, two sorts of things uh, need to happen and the policies might look something like this. I would say first and foremost is a change in the mindsets of the people that clamor or the swell, uh, groundswell of public opinion in favor of climate action that is needed. That is the kind of thing that happened with COVID-19 where people did want to take some of the actions that countries, governments, uh, public sector, et cetera, were trying to uh, instill. Now, uh, as a result, on, a, on the flip side, uh, the air is cleaner, the water is better, biodiversity is making a little bit of a comeback. Those we celebrate, but we do not want to have those at the expense of poverty reduction either. Uh, but the reality is that in 2008, when similar glimmers of hope on sustainable, environmentally sustainable development were there, they just went back with a vengeance. Uh, not only did they go back, but the carbon emissions since then uh, have been rising, let alone being stable and not to think of falling. So Wuhan, which has it started to open up, uh, again, uh, the carbon emissions and, uh, and, and uh, pollutants in the air started going up. So, the huge questions that you're posing is that what are the low hanging fruits in terms of uh, locking in some of the improvements that we have seen, but really looking at a sustainable future where uh, policies can be designed to make a difference. I will simply say that on the public side, some of the good things that could be done, like insisting on uh, fuel engine standards for airlines, uh, in insisting uh, that the flight routes and airplane designs be changed. Uh, uh, Singapore Airlines has a game plan on that. Much more needs to be done. All of these would be examples uh, of what people can do. But at the end of the day, 
again, going back to Ben's framework, in this case, there has to be thou shalt not do command and control elements to get results. And for that, the final answer that I would give is that we need to elect into office people who sense the urgency uh, for the urgency for the long term, not urgency for being reelected only uh, uh, in real time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the five top emitters in the world today, the United States, China, India, Russia, and add to that Japan, plus Germany, which is a different story that I mentioned. But in any case, five of them are led by uh, leaders who may not be seeing the urgency um, uh, of the climate crisis, and in some cases, outright hostile to the action. So that needs to change. So the lowest hanging fruits, uh, Susan, would be people's uh, mindsets and leadership that would underpin that with policy change in favor of low carbon uh, economic growth. Yeah, so I, I was looking on the side because one of the questions also asked that, and I think you answered it already, which was, really what can we tell our policymakers to have a similar sense of urgency towards addressing climate change i think you answered that uh, especially also in developing countries and where they should begin i think you made that very clear but it also starts actually with the people who elect um, these leaders to make these decisions into office and i think this is where um, the next question for janet uh, uh, fits very well, and that is, um, uh, Janet, you are uh, a behavioral a social science uh, a scientist, and, and you look at um, uh, how people sometimes uh, react very differently from the evidence. Um, Janet, what do you see now during the pandemic in terms of different kind of behavior and psychology, how people react, what kind of compromises they do in their daily life? Um, while um, we, we haven't seen them or we don't see them in that way um, in, in, in terms of, of, of climate change um, uh, related behavior. So people are willing to stay at home now for in some countries uh, like in mine, the Philippines, for eight weeks and, and, uh, and so on. But we are still, we would take the plane over the weekend to go somewhere or uh, we uh, don't make sure that poor people can actually use clean um, uh, transport mechanisms to go from A to, to B. So what's different in this pandemic in terms of the language that triggers this extreme behavior? Well, there's no question that like, global action on climate change it com you know, pales in comparison to what we're seeing now in COVID-19 response. And I don't, I don't think it's a very, it, it's a pretty easy uh, uh, description of why. COVID-19 has, has this great sense of urgency, immediacy, and personal vulnerability. You know, the risk of illness and death for ourselves and the people who we love. In contrast, climate change is slow moving, less immediate, less visible. Uh, people believe that. Of course, that's not the case as we hear from Ben and Vinod. But many people also feel a lack of control or efficacy to do anything in terms of of climate change uh, at the planetary level. But in both cases, it's important to remember that every single day, 7.6 billion people are making behavioral decisions that impact pandemic spread of disease and that impact climate change. And so we can focus a bit on this individual uh, behavior choice, but I'll come back to Vinod and, and the policy issues and say that beyond individual decision making, uh, such as you know, whether we get on a plane or not for the weekend or using a mask or not just choosing to social isolate, but being able to social isolate because you don't have a job that you must be to in order to feed your family, tying again these issues around poverty and choice. Um, so what we really need to be focused on also on the policy side are the structural changes such as policies, the actual policies that restrict travel, community preparedness, increase community preparedness that enable us to respond to this crisis. But as you said, Suzanne, also to the future crises that we will surely face. We need access to healthcare, social services and resources that enable us to act and to recognize that we have to take collective responsibility for uh, a more, more durable action. 
And it's really, in some ways, I, I'm trained as a psychologist, but also in public health. And I like, you know, this, this conversation, really, I think for solutions, we need to think both about that individual, um, individual choice, but the structural changes, the policies. And as, uh, just to amplify what Benoit said one moment more, the questions about green policy and policy with equity at its heart will not just uh, be favorable in terms of climate outcomes, but of course they're the root uh, and the very foundation for policies that will nurture and sustain health now and in the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Janet. Of course, there's also this uh, this kind of war language that we have here in the media around the pandemics, like uh, we, we have a common enemy and people feel kind of uh, aligned against that. So probably something similar is required for climate, although I personally don't like the war language. But talking about the policy changes and also this kind of the need to have affirmative action, um, a look at poverty, change behavior and so on. I'd like to ask Ben now, it seems we are really at a critical juncture uh, somehow. I mean, we, we saw this coming even before uh, COVID-19, and maybe this is now um, uh, the, the big test. Um, before COVID, we saw there was a trend of weaker states and more market-driven initiatives to solve global problems, but it seemed we weren't really doing it. Um, we weren't really able to solve these problems. It's going in the wrong direction. So now we see the desire for stronger agency, stronger states, stronger directions, more collective agreements and actions. How do you see this? Is this a critical juncture also for a new era of, of governance and a new era of public, public policy making? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that's the fundamental uh, question in this whole, um, the whole conversation. Um, you know, going back to these four moral philosophies, we know that it's the case that type three, type two and type one dominate the policy process. And, and uh, around the world. And so if we want to make things type four, where they're given the priority they need to be solved, how do we do that? And so we argue, and I, with my um, colleagues, Levin, Ald, and Bernstein, we argue that climate change and the biodiversity crisis are what we call super wicked problems. And so we say more attention to problem structure might help us uncover creative solutions. Um, so in, in the climate case, in the biodiversity case, we say, look, there's four key features that make them unique and not solvable by type three, two, and one frameworks. And they are one, time is running out. Some point is too late to address the problem. And that gives a certain kind of stress for the policy process. Ty uh, uh, feature two, no central authority. No one place in the world to go. And this is what we're seeing with the pandemic right now. There's all kinds of diff diffuse authority and fragmented authority happening, confusing authority. Um, the third feature is that those people who are wanting to solve the problem are also causing the problem. So the battles with ourselves, and that's the case in COVID, the case in biodiversity and the case in climate. And the uh, fourth feature is that the policy responses um, are irrational based on the time preferences uh, uh, challenges that we face. And so we say, look, well, what do you do if type three and type two and type one frameworks can't help you? And we say, you've got to think of creating what we call in my world, critical junctures, historical moments that can create path dependent processes that can lock in our future selves into solving the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and in this case, COVID management. And so the key question here is, we have a crisis and people say, oh, we're changing, you know, we're all doing things differently. But most crises, after they're over, we revert back to our previous selves and there was no long-term change. And so we're saying now's the time to think about how you would create path dependency uh, to manage future pandemics in ways where we would have the deliberations about the different moral philosophies, we would allow scientists based on epidemiology and not based on debates about type two or type one to get in the way so we can solve this problem in a proactive way as the science becomes clear, but not um, distracted by geopolitics. Um, we think that what's really cool about these terrible COVID pandemic is that each country has a self-interest in creating 
more of a global authority. Because without global management, this problem can't be managed well. And so even if you only care about your domestic interests, you still want a global mechanism at play. And that might create the critical juncture for thinking about not just COVID, but also how do we better manage climate and biodiversity that needs more central authority to be effective. So we should see some real hope here in the possible possibility of creating this critical juncture moment if we're careful and do it well. Okay, um, Ben, can you give an example of a critical juncture in the past so that we can relate um, better to it? Yeah, so one really cool example is um, in the United States Pacific Northwest, there is what we call a thermostatic institution that requires that federal agencies manage for what's called species viability. So if the science says that a species is gonna become extinct um, I, uh, according to uh, existing practices of logging and mining and so on, then you must change those practices in ways that is consistent with the science of conserving that species, okay? So as a result, the United States 20 years ago locked up its remaining old growth forest to save an endangered species called the Northern Spotted Owl, which was a type four problem. Even though it was gonna hurt the economy to some degree, the policy in place was so entrenched and Americans supported it so much that it had this mechanism in place that caused us to not just think about our economic selves, but also our interests as humans in the natural environment. So these things do exist and they create these special moments. Um, but um, uh, and they also exist, exist, for example, in monetary policy. Every country has a board that creates interest rate policy that's very durable and locked in. And we're saying, why can't we do the same for pandemics? Why can't we do the same thing for biodiversity? Why not for climate? They do exist elsewhere and they can, we can do them here. Looking at the current political environment, do you think there is actually um, uh, appetite to create a, a new global agency that would define what are the, the public goods that we all have to protect? Right. So I never met anybody who said to me, Ben, I want to endanger a species. It never happened. So the thing is, we all carry with ourselves different moral philosophies all the time. And yet our, our, uh, our analytical tools, our political processes bias some of our moral philosophies over others. And so all we're saying is, no, we all hold these feelings dear. How do we give voice to those moral philosophies that don't yet have an institutional mechanism? So that's, that's a good, um, I think, um, pass to, to the question for Vinod. Uh, Vinod, so how do we, we are saying, how do we give voice um, uh, to these, um, uh, to the, well, to the, well, to everybody who actually wants to protect the environment, doesn't want to uh, contribute to climate change, and what are the national and regional and global um, kind of forces that we can put on policymakers to move from these low-hanging fruits to the game of the long, to protecting public goods. Um, what's required for that? And, and who is in the position right now to, um, to, to, to create that buy-in from policymakers? So that's a great uh, concern, Suzanne. I think uh, in this case, uh, what is critical is to realize that from all what we said, it looks like uh, we know the what, uh, or the, the world, the society knows the science and the economics adding up to the what to do. But we are all floundering on the how. How do we go from A to B? And uh, I think at the outset, um, uh, Ben may have mentioned, or I think uh, Jeanette mentioned, we are looking at probably the biggest disconnect between scientific knowledge and uh, policy action that human uh, race has ever seen. Why is that? What can we do? So uh, at the end of the day, there is a big role that is being played by special interests, uh, whose interests in the small part of the global setting is hurt by switching, let's say, from fossil fuels, highly polluting fuels, to solar, wind, and other renewable forms of energy. And if that uh, minority uh, is able to block action, uh, 
uh, then we can talk all we want about the low hang hanging fruit, but what you are looking for in terms of tract uh, that uh, changes with traction over a long period of time will be hard to bring about. That's where the groundswell of public opinion will help. That's where the leadership in this, especially the five big emitting economies uh, will, will help. Uh, but let me just add one more thing. Uh, again, a lesson from the COVID experience. Um, yes, it is tough to go from A to B given special interest and lobbying uh, and all the constraints that are put on taking actions that are in the public interest. Uh, but money can help. So I think you alluded to that. Is there a role for uh, international organizations and so on? Absolutely, yes. But it is incredibly important how finances were raised in, in COVID by countries individually, not, not necessarily by groups. And so in that process, um, I think the G20, the group of 20, my rough estimate is that um, in a short order, five trillion dollars were raised. And we are talking about two and a half uh, trillion a year for the transition that IPCC thinks that is needed uh, if um, uh, we need to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, uh, over the coming years. And so raising financing, uh, which is feasible, which is possible, but we need to have that sense of urgency as uh, uh, one of the panelists called uh, a war footing. And if we don't like that, we almost seem to need to behave as though maybe literally there is no, there is no tomorrow if we didn't act. Thank you, Vinod. It seems um, before we turn the, to the uh, to the more to the questions of the of the audience, I'd like to ask Janet one more question because it seems that um, even before COVID, it seemed a lot that technology was the beacon of hope. Like, yeah, we will advance technology so that we will have you know sustainable industry solutions and and green growth and so on. But it seems now that we are actually also at this critical juncture in behavior and values and emotions and common visions. And um, I think we start to understand what a huge role media, social media, interactions, um, influencing opinions and so on play. So can you maybe um, discuss a little bit how you think we, can, we need to leverage the, the change in behavior, values, and emotions, and our ability to reach people also differently to create that critical juncture and create that buy-in that's required from the bottom in all, um, in all areas of society? It's a great question. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with the technology piece and say, I think that to create this critical juncture, we need, I like to say, we need both high tech and high touch. And so the technology is important. We need the testing, we need the vaccines, we need you know, 3D printing of N95 masks. Uh, we need the medicines uh, to respond to this and new threats. But at the same time, we need a trained and compassionate workforce, healthcare workforce, and we need leadership who can lead us through this crisis. Um, we do need financial resources to pay for the tech uh, and the research and the care that's required. A resilient system, whether it's a resilient ecological system or a resilient um, healthcare system or a resilient community is one that can prepare for, withstand the stress of, and respond and recover to the threats uh, of a disaster or an emergency. And so while technology is important, it's certainly uh, not the only thing. So in a way, um, what we discussed before, we, we talked about the need to create new kinds of institutions at the global level, at the national level, um, institutions that look more into the future, um, that create a, a common understanding of the public goods, that also communicate a sense of urgency on these public goods to create buy-in from the population and all levels of citizens. Is, is that what you, what you also describe, what you see? Absolutely, a hundred percent. You said it well. I mean, I think we really need, uh, um, in order to create uh, collective action, we actually 
in some sense need some intellectual humility to take the warnings and the recommendations of all science seriously. We need to fund rigorous studies on health and on climate change and their uh, intersection. And then we need to use these results to guide policy and practice. Uh, the money, you know, how we spend all that money that Vinod is going to raise too, you know, these, this can't be uh, by chance, but really driven by um, empirical evidence. And it's so critically important to recognize that what we do now, what we do every single day, will either mitigate or exacerbate the crisis. Or crises, both together. And I mean, one interesting point there is you're pointing to the issue of science and Yes, sorry. I, I hope not the rest of the audience lost you because somehow the internet was unstable on my side. Um, uh, you, you're emphasizing the need for science and evidence-based policy making. Um, however, during the pandemic, we see it, it looks like competition in science rather than real um, collaboration. What needs to change also for uh, the climate change agenda that we see more collaboration and less competition? I mean, I, you know, I think this sense of recognizing that, the, you know, these are existential crises and we have seen obviously political movements before, I mean, it, you know, recently, but even before this latest COVID crisis that are moving more toward nationalist and populist agendas. Uh, and I do agree with the note that, you know, uh, our elected officials, the leaders who are going to guide us into the future are critically important to recognize uh, this interconnectedness. You know, perhaps it's no surprise that those who are, I'll say, anti-science, you know, the climate deniers are the same group of vocal people. I'd like to think a small group, but a very vocal people are, are also the COVID deniers. And we need to, we need to push with uh, evidence and um, funding and policy to assure that science takes, that really drives uh, these, our decision making, that it's not the denial and the distortion and the dismissal of the science. Uh, in fact, what we really need is to uh, bring this all forward. And I think we are seeing that happening now, as again, as we recognize these life and death choices and the impacts of what we're doing, um, you know, affecting ourselves, our families, our communities, and uh, nations and the, and the world as a whole. So I do feel uh, uh, as much as we're in the midst of, of you know, some very serious uh, crises from very serious decision making, decision making, I do see a glimmer of hope. And perhaps it is the undeniable optimist in me that believes, you know, we must have some hope and optimism in order to move forward uh, effectively. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Jeanette. Um, I, I, I like your optimistic outlook. Uh, it means that we need to have these, um, uh, the, 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 the global institutions, but also at the national level, these institutions, we need to have more funding for science and for these um, public goods. I'd like to turn now to some of the questions of the audience. Um, and one was, I think it's a very good question, and probably it's one for, uh, for Ben and Vinod, and that is, uh, can you give examples of any kind of effective global level initiatives or policies um, that have been effective? So any kind of global level mechanism that, that was effective in, 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 in creating some kind of affirmative action on policymakers? Yeah. Yeah, can I speak? Am I on? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, very good question. In fact, the sort of the classic case that's uh, usually referred to is that of the ozone layer in the Montreal uh, Protocol, where uh, governments did agree to binding uh, reductions in ozone depleting chemicals that did have a significant effect in reducing the ozone. And so a lot of work's been done asking, why did it happen on ozone, but not on climate? Okay, and there are different explanations for that. One is that actually they found a good business case scenario uh, to, uh, as for replacement uh, technologies. Um, but the broader point is they created a very durable global institution because countries realized they were all better off by doing so. Our issue is not that. Our issue is 
what do we want to um, identify as the most important moral philosophy when addressing the climate crisis? Is it around economic benefits that accrue, as Vino's talked about, some synergies, right, and livelihoods that improve? Or do we want to say that those things are about how we might get to solve the ecological crisis, not whether? Mm -hmm. So are we actually looking at the wrong evidence with which to think about motivating type four problem uh, solving efforts around the climate crisis. And what we find really interesting about COVID management is that a lot of governments are taking implicit type four thinking into their management strategies that we don't yet see in the climate crisis. I see a lot of hope in that, in that context. But Ben, is it, I mean, uh, maybe that's a question for Jeanette. I haven't seen it on here, but it's, it's one reason also that many of those who are making decisions in governments are men and men are more affected by severe COVID and they feel this is an immediate threat to them, whereas uh, the climate agenda is in the future and, and their lifetime is half over. I mean, that's a provocative question, but Jeanette, you might be able to answer that. <laughs> you know, yes, do I think we, you know, I think when we look at global leadership, we certainly see many strong women who are, I think, moving forward with um, uh, strong and compassionate policies. I think, in general, it, you know, this short-term thinking is tied to the to uh, you know to um, political timeframes of two years and four years and six years. So we do need, you know, again, collectively to have this longer window and to recognize, uh, I'll say that, again, the decisions we make today clear, you know, really are existential in terms of mitigating or increasing these threats. So I'd certainly like to see, uh, you know, more leaders as we have in Germany and uh, New Zealand, for example. Younger, younger and more diverse. So you took the positive spin to it, which was nice. <laughs> you were a negative on it. So um, uh, another question here, which comes up uh, uh, a few times is, do we need a voluntary approach or do we need really an, an affirmative approach um, to, climb, to the climate uh, change agenda? And is an affirmative approach possible? Be not, I think this is an excellent question for you. You've tried affirmative actions a lot in development uh, banking also. Hmm. Uh, I hope you don't think this as a cop-out, but in this case, you need both. And the reason is that voluntary uh, approaches would be absolutely wonderful. Lifestyle changes is an example, but we are looking at a quintessential uh, example of what is called a spillover effect that A pollutes and B, C and D suffer the impact of the pollution disproportionately, particularly the poor, and A has not enough of a motivation to control that unless we have some mechanism to say, thou shalt not. We've learned that from experience. We would have liked to rely on goodwill, but that just wasn't enough. And now with the emergency that we are facing, it just will not be enough going forward. So if I may connect this uh, with the previous question, um, one piece is we didn't talk about the role of governments and countries and multilateral organization. Suzanne, your organization, ADB, uh, the World Bank, IMF, the leader of the IMF recently had a big pronouncement on this, uh, a good one. Uh, and taken together, we are again looking at trillions uh, over the coming decades. If that can be directed, because there is some ability to direct that uh, to green uh, or sustainable forms of investment, that would help. One stumbling block, as an economist, I can admit this, uh, I would say in the past has been growth economists have been far too slow and in some uh, cases actually misleading in thinking that any investment, any way you do it for short-term growth is the best thing you can do for poverty reduction. False. I think we have learned the hard way that sustained and sustainable growth is the better way and until growth economists and policy advisors who have a great deal of influence on uh, finance ministers and global leaders uh, give the motivation that you can have a different type of economic growth 
that is qualitatively better, that emphasizes not just physical capital and financial capital, but also human and environmental biodiversity and climate capital. Until that change takes place, uh, we probably will not have internalized sufficiently the kind of change uh, that we are talking about today. And yes. I, just, I just want to add very quickly, I think this really harkens back to what I said a moment ago, which is structural changes really are the best ways to motivate behavior. These nudges, you know, the, both the policies on the one hand, but what do we have access to, what's visible? And so, I, I, you know, these do go hand in hand. So Janet, this will basically also mean something like I have a mandatory daily app where I would see how much have I contributed today to mitigating climate change, uh, reduce plastic, so I have the sense of achievement every day that I've actually made a difference. Is that something you would think of? Yeah, again, I think it's not any one thing, right? It's, it's all these individual nudges, but I think I'm pushing even more in that public health lens and the economic lens, which is the idea that you know, the, the policies and, and those things that are visible in our environments where we have constraints or um, resources that enable us to make those wise choices. That it's, you know, it's not just the choice, but the environmental um, access that we have in order to do that. You know, it's the reason that when we go to a, uh, when we're able to go to the supermarket checkout aisle, that there are certain things, you know, in, in that aisle that um, uh, are, nudging us to purchase. Uh, we need the good nudges to make the wise choices. Thank you, we are, we are close to the top of the hour. There's, there's one point which, um, and we have uh, four more minutes left, and this is, um, uh, many are mentioning sustainable um, and inclusive businesses and, and how to drive those. How do we create, I mean, we're talking, all, we're talking already about sustainable businesses, inclusive businesses, and so on, but do we really have the policy environment in most, especially for our developing countries, to allow for sustainable businesses? Maybe, um, I don't know, we not, do you want to take that question, or, or Ben? Okay, I, I, I will make a comment. Um, I think the... Uh, movement uh, that has uh, been set afoot uh, on sustainable uh, business practices um, the, across the world, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, its impact should not be minimized because at the end of the day, although uh, I said at the beginning that uh, we seem to know the science and we seem to know the technology, it is the how to implement them, uh, that is a bigger constraint. That's still the case but we need to make quite a lot of headway still on how renewable energies can be stored, how they can be distributed, how they can become part of the grid. And for example, in the case of Singapore, a great example where uh, natural gas is 95%. Uh, that is positive compared to coal, but it is still not positive enough compared to its carbon emissions. And so how does a, a place like Singapore manage to do better and more on the score uh, and there the possibility of solar energy being imported from Australia and there are a multitude of technological breakthroughs where business leaders big and small can make a huge difference so I think uh, it would be a mistake to rely just on government action although in this case uh, command and control is critical but the business uh, communities underpinning that okay. uh, would be key uh -huh. as well. Can I come in? Just do it. Can, can, I, can, I, can I respond to this? Um, yes, if you have yeah. only a minute to say something and then we need to yeah. wrap up and I, I, we need to yeah. finish with, with one question and, and think about three final words, please. So let, me, let me just say that you know, I've worked for the last 25 years on market mechanisms and sustainable business approaches to these questions. And there's no, no question that there's well-intentioned actors involved in the space doing really good things, but it's coincided with, with massive biodiversity loss and increasing climate emissions. So we also know that the evidence is not consistent so far with how things have gone to date. And so my answer would be, let's do a better job of linking whatever mechanism it is, voluntary regulation or whatever, to the problem at hand. 
And so from Singapore to um, uh, Canada, um, COVID could not be managed by voluntary approaches. It had to have command and control. I think this is a good last word because one of the questions that was flagged to me here is, um, what do we need ideally in terms of global leadership right now to, um, to, to manage the COVID pandemic in the most efficient way? And you said we need to have um, a very clear affirmative action at the global level and everybody yeah. needs to follow them because otherwise we won't be able to end this um, in a, in a, in a, a, as soon as possible, correct? That's right. And we need durable bodies like monetary boards that have the flexibility to adapt to the epidemiology and the science, yes. but not be shaped by the politics of crisis management. Exactly. So we have uh, only uh, 30 seconds left. So maybe, uh, um, Inot, what do you want to give on the way um, to people who are managing the COVID crisis right now? Consider this as a marathon, a long haul, and we need systemic changes. Celebrate the short gains that we are making. Recurring big ticket items and calamities are with us. And so prevention as much as possible and systems that allow us to think differently in preventing will have a high premium. Thank you, thank you. I think we are the top of the hour. I hope the, con the discussion continues and we will have more um, uh, interaction with all of you. Thank you very much and thank you to the audience. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.